going to be food and uh, booze outside. And not booze. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to describe some of the work that my group's been doing on developing stochastic gradient MCMC methods, both from independent IID and dependent data sources. Um, and various parts of this talk are joint work with my students, Yan Ma, Tianchi Chen, and Jack Baker, and my postdoc, Nick Fodi. OK, so one of the big emphases in my group is looking at time series applications. And they tend to be high dimensional, complex processes that we're observing and trying to analyze. Um, one example of this is a collaboration we've had with Zillow for some years, so where the goal is to model a local level housing index. So from historical house sales observations, we want to estimate the value at a very local level and how that value changes over time. And in this application, one thing that we've shown is um, really important is to discover regions that behave similarly over time um, and use that to share information between these regions and improve local estimates. So here's a city of Seattle analysis where each one of these colors, if it's the same color across regions, that means those regions were discovered to behave similarly. Um, and for each one of these different clusters of regions, here's the latent value in that region averaged across these, these different regions over time. Um, another set of applications that we focus on quite heavily is um, neuroimaging data sets. So for example, in MEG, a person sits in this chair and wears this helmet with all these spatially distributed sensors that provide recordings of underlying brain activity. And this data provides this really um, high resolution neuroimaging data set with very good time resolution. Um, and a question here might be to infer something like functional connectivity networks, which are statements of which um, regions in the brain work together in response to a given stimuli. Um, another data source that we've looked at is intracranial EEG, and I'll skip over the gory picture. <laughs> but the point is that not only do you have a single channel of activity, but you have a large collection of different channels, and there's really intricate relationships in um, how these things evolve over time. So maybe from this data, we might be interested in automatically parsing these types of recordings into interpretable states for um, a neurologist to study and start analyzing what type of seizures are present in a given patient's recordings, or maybe algorithms could do this automatically. Um, but this little snippet of data that I showed is just one little episode within a very long recording. And there are many episodes of interest, and these recordings are sometimes on the order of two weeks long. OK, so in general, when we're thinking about analyzing these types of um, high dimensional, large, complex time series, um, we often end up taking, not always, but often end up taking a Bayesian modeling approach. Um, in theory, it can be really nice for um, discovering shared structure and modeling intricate relationships. Um, but that's really in theory. In practice, you often end up hitting up against a lot of the Bayesian inference issues that we've heard today. Um, so another big push in my group has been on developing scalable Bayesian inference techniques along the lines of things that all the Davids have talked about today. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, my name's not David, so changing it a bit here. But um, we're going to focus in specifically on MCMC and thinking about how we target these complex posteriors arising from these complex models, intricate data sources, especially in these large data settings. OK, so more specifically, we're going to write our posterior as pi. And it's just prior proportional time to prior times likelihood. And so one of the challenges we're talking about is the fact that the structure of our posterior might be really complex. Um, so some examples of complex features of, of posteriors might be um, being very multi multimodal or having strong correlations across dimensions. Um, and these types of structures pose challenges to traditional sampling-based methods. Very hard to mix between these modes or really explore these different contours. Um, so this is an issue of efficiency of the sampler. David was referring to this as you know, having to do with mixing rates of these samplers. Um, but another challenge is the fact that we might just have lots and lots of observations that we're conditioning on. So we want to incorporate all these observations in drawing our inferences. And how do we do this efficiently? Um, so a very standard example these days, thanks to David and his <laughs> followings, are um, just looking at 
um, document analysis and having tons and tons of documents that you want to parse through. So we'll come back to the, uh, Wikipedia corpus analysis later. Um, but this is an issue of scalability, um, this per iteration complexity of doing <coughs> sampling. OK, so what's a classic approach to doing MCMC? Well, typically people look at jump processes. And one very standard approach is the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, where you define a kernel that depends on your past sampled value. And you use that to propose your next value. And then you either accept or reject this proposal. So this is an example of a jump process. You're just going to be jumping around this space. And often, it's really hard to move between low probability regions. And it really um, inefficiently explores this posterior. OK. So instead, um, over the last five plus years, there's been growing interest in what I'll call continuous dynamic-based samplers, or gradient MCMC. And these are methods at a very high level that define either stochastic or deterministic dynamics to explore some energy landscape. I'll explain what this energy landscape represents. Uh, somehow it's related to this target posterior you're interested in. And by using these dynamics, um, you're able to simulate these very distant proposals. OK, so one popular example of such a continuous dynamic sampler is um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, or HMC. So this is the same target distribution we um, looked at before. Um, but here, we're going to write it as the exponentiation of a negative potential energy, where in the case of Bayesian inference, this potential energy is just log um, likelihood times prior. And for all these continuous dynamic base samplers, I want to mention we're going to be focusing on the parameters living in r to the d. Okay, okay so continuous parameter space. Well, in HMC, what we do is we augment this distribution of interest with an auxiliary variable, r, which is going to represent momentum in some physical system. And then jointly, these two terms are going to define this energy landscape um, that we're going to be exploring. So in particular, we now have a joint distribution over theta, our parameters of interest, and this auxiliary variable, r. And we write this as the potential energy plus this kinetic energy term, thinking of r as momentum. So the sum of these two terms is called the Hamiltonian or total energy. OK, so now that we've defined what this energy landscape is, um, what HMC does is it uses Hamiltonian dynamics to explore these, um, this landscape. And in particular, what Hamiltonian dynamics will do is for walk around a given level set of this landscape. So, um, and we're going to specifically be collecting samples at some fixed time interval as we're walking around this level set. Um, so more formally, you can write down Hamiltonian dynamics as follows. Um, and there's this nice analogy with playing ice hockey that's due to Radford Neal, um, where here there's a puck, has position theta, has some mass, and it has momentum. Um, and you're playing on this frictionless ice surface. But the surface isn't flat. It's really a hilly surface. So this is really what you're playing on. Um, and the gradient of your um, potential energy is defining the slope of the surface at any point theta in, in, your, um, in the space. OK, so because this puck has momentum, this is what's going to help us um, simulate these distant proposals. Um, and one of the really key things about Hamiltonian dynamics is the fact that they leave your target distribution invariant. Um, Sorry, just to make yeah. so are you interested in the r equal to 0 and the rest of it is to make it more efficient? or So r equal to 0. No, so I'm going to describe that on, on the next slide. So we're interested in adding this r to give us this momentum the, to these dynamics. And we're going to simulate jointly theta and r. So to get ergodicity, so far we've just talked about for basically a fixed value of r walking around a level set. But to get ergodicity. Um, which you need in order to ensure that your simulated samples are samples from the desired target distribution. Um, HMC resamples this momentum variable. So you're going to be jumping between these level sets and then walking around them. Um, and then if you just want samples of theta, that was our original goal, what do you do? Well, if you're familiar with MCMC, 
you just discard your samples of R, and you're going to get samples from the desired target distribution just on theta. OK. So HMC represents one possible set of dynamics um, that we can use to get these types of explorations of these energy landscapes, or equivalently target posteriors. Um, and what we said is we want pi to be invariant under our specified dynamics, so that if we also have ergodicity, then the simulated samples are samples from the desired posterior. Um, but there are lots of other dynamics that we could specify. And a question is, out of all these possible dynamics, which ones have this property of having the right stationary distribution? Um, so out of all possible continuous Markov processes, which you can equate with these, defining these either um, these different uh, continuous dynamics, only a subset will leave pi invariant. So we said HMC has that property. So, do, so does um, the simpler Langevin-based dy dynamics. And there are also dynamics that you can define, which are just Riemann variants of these algorithms that also have the right um, stationary distribution. But a natural question is, is there a general recipe for constructing such a dynamic that will live in this space? So for constructing a, a sampler that has the right um, target distribution as its stationary distribution. Well, my student Ian Ma had this really nice insight that it is possible to do this. So in particular, we're going to think of having this posterior on some set of variables z, which are going to represent both our parameters of interest as well as some potential auxiliary variables like this momentum variable. And we're going to write just like in HMC, and in terms of this total energy or this energy landscape H. Um, and um, what the, the formula is, is Yin defined this stochastic differential equation that's solely specified in terms of a positive semi-definite matrix D, a skew symmetric matrix Q, and then you pass in the form of this total energy. And if you simulate from this SDE, um, then you're, you're doing the right thing. So these dynamics leave pi as the invariant distribution. OK, so if you want to know what the SDE looks like, it looks like the following. You don't need to digest this to understand the rest of this talk. Um, but H is our total energy, and W is a d-dimensional Wiener process. Yeah? How do you choose D and Q? So that's a question I'll come back to after. Is that OK? Can I return to that question? So the, the so this is a framework. There's multiple points to this framework, and maybe I'll highlight that as I'm going through, if that's okay. So one is showing that if your if your dynamics have this form, you know you're doing the right thing. So if you can cast your dynamics in this form, you're doing the right thing. You can also use it to propose new samplers by looking at new new D's and Q's. Okay. So what we showed is that um, if you use this SDE for any positive semi-definite D and skew symmetric Q, then you're in this right part of this space. Um, and one of the cool things is all these samplers that I mentioned before, you can actually cast in this framework. So you can um, extract what the D and Q are to put these samplers into our SDE framework. Um, but more importantly, any valid sampler you can write down has a D and Q in our framework. So what that means is as you're exploring the space of all possible Ds and Qs, you're exploring the space of all possible samplers, valid samplers. Is D and Q are associated like one-to-one? -one associated? D, D and Q are like one-to-one. -one. For a particular D, there is one particular Q, or you can be? You can choose. Like, you give me any D, any Q, and I can write down a valid sampler. It seems like this recipe doesn't include piecewise deterministic. Uh, Markov processes. Right. So we're focused on, yeah. The so, it wouldn't, so it wouldn't be all continuous Markov processes that have that? Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what's the blue versus the red yeah. region? What's the definition of that? So the red region are the, is the region where you don't have the right, it's modifying the, the distribution and you're, it's no longer invariant under the specified dynamics. But you, I mean, so you have a particular SDE, but you have some sort of closure argument, I guess. So it, is that right in your, in your theory to say it's all? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it'll be close to the jump. Yeah. 
So you're saying but that it's like it does not contain the piecewise. So you're saying it's like dense in that or something? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's exactly what this statement is saying. It's a, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a constructive proof to show that <coughs> this is true. Okay, so let's get into um, some of the nitty gritty practical details of using these types of samplers. Um, one is the fact that, of course, in general, you can't simulate from the continuous dynamics, so you're going to consider, consider some epsilon discretization. Um, so instead of walking exactly along here, you're going to take some m little steps of this, this discretization to go from one value to the next simulated value. And so, of course, there's some discretization error. Um, recently, we've shown that you can correct for this bias um, using an irreversible Metropolis-Hastings algorithm that Ian proposed. I'm not going to go through the details here. Um, but what I want to focus on is the fact that there's this gradient computation, which, as we've heard many times today, and is probably pretty obvious, is really computationally intensive for large data. So um, in particular, for each one of these little steps here, you have to make a pass through your entire data set. So really horribly inefficient for large data sets. OK, so these continuous dynamic-based samplers are really nice in terms of efficiency of exploring these target posteriors, but um, don't scale well to very large data sets. So let's think about how we can scale these gradient-based MCMC procedures. Um, and if you've been awake in the machine learning literature any time in recent history, the answer should be obvious. You just replace um, your true gradient or full data gradient with a stochastic gradient. Um, so we have some mini batch of observations. We're going to have this correction factor so that um, for mini batches sampled uniformly at random, this is going to be an unbiased estimate of the, the true gradient. OK, well, we're also further going to appeal to the central limit theorem to assume that the noise in this gradient is Gaussian, and we need this for the analysis that we're going to do. OK, but the high level point here is that now we only have to touch a small amount of our, our data per step um, in this algorithm. So I mean, if you, you, you showed this application where you had like, time series with enormous numbers of points. And you have that for multiple subjects. And so do you sample the times uniformly? So this is IID. So I'm going to get back to that when I get to the dependent part. Yeah, that's a very good point. Because every talk and every paper ever written on this, and that's not actually a true statement, but does not state this IID assumption. And I yet I also haven't done that, but I will get back to this idea. Okay. So right now we're assuming IID data, not the types of time series that I, I talked about. OK, so does this work? Well, there's hope that it would, right? That's kind of been the story in the literature. You take your gradient descent method or your gradient-based method, you replace a stochastic gradient, and you can prove things like stochastic gradient descent. You can prove convergence, um, different rates, of course. But things work out pretty nicely. And they're practically really nice. Um, and there's also been some nice stories in the MCMC world. Um, Max Welling and E.Y. Tay proposed this stochastic gradient version of the Langevin dynamic-based sampler. So those are simpler non-momentum-based dynamics. Um, and there you can show that it's doing the right thing. Um, and of course, it's been well known in the optimization world that stochastic gradient descent with momentum can give significantly faster convergence. Um, so a question is, what can we say about momentum-based sampling? So what happens to our HMC algorithm when we replace the gradient with the noisy gradient? OK, well, instead of um, having just our standard Hamiltonian dynamics, we now have these noisy Hamiltonian dynamics. So this would be um, from our stochastic gradient. And so we can think of this as not playing ice hockey inside, but playing ice hockey outside, where there's this random wind blowing. And we're still on this frictionless ice surface, but this random wind is going to blow the puck away. So it's a very informal statement, but more formally, we can prove that pi is no longer than variant distribution. And actually, we prove even more than that, that the entropy of this distribution increases with time, so things go horribly wrong with this. OK, so what can we do? So far, the story is pretty negative here. Well, Tianchi um, had this really nice insight of introduce some friction. So um, instead of playing ice hockey, go play street hockey. And so now there's still this random wind blowing. 
but you have the friction from the street surface that's counterbalancing it. Um, and very formally, it's exactly counterbalancing the, this noise. And now pi is, again, then varying distribution under these dynamics. OK, so um, we are able to define this stochastic gradient version of HMC through this correction by adding a friction term to the dynamics. Um, and under certain specifications of this algorithm, you reduce to SGD with momentum or to the simpler dynamics of SGLD. OK, um, I also want to mention that in practice, um, you have this step size that you need to choose. And you need the step size to be going to 0 to get um, your bias to go to 0 for these algorithms. And in practice, we don't want to do that. So we allow for some bias and just use a, a finite epsilon in practice. So you're not doing any metropolis correction, though, at any stage? Not in what I'm presenting here. I didn't go into that. There's a paper that we, we've posted, and we have further results on that. But we're not doing, we're just like in, so SGLD had the same assumption of relying on this small epsilon asymptotics, but we're, not, or, um, but we're not, so we're doing the same thing here, but it is possible, actually, as we've shown, to use, to introduce a correction term. We, people didn't know how to do that before. Yeah. So this scales up MCMC the same way that David's algorithms scale it up, because we now have these stochastic gradients. Right. Well, I'm going to do a quick compare and contrast that goes through not the stuff, similar kind of thing. So it's a different it's version. Parallels. Well, are you talking about the embarrassingly parallel stuff or which? Yeah, or just I'll go through a compare and contrast. Yeah. Sorry. A lot of I'll get back to that. But That's yeah. Fine. So it seems yeah. like to do this momentum, you need to know what the variance is. But in practice, you don't really know what the variance of your. Yeah. So I skipped over. I have some It's details are in the paper. You don't actually need to know what the variance is. You're right. I was hoping people wouldn't notice that because I don't have time to go through it in this talk. This assumes you know what the variance is, but we don't actually assume that in the algorithm we're proposing. Yeah. So good catch. Look at the paper for more details. <laughs> OK. Um, or look at the next slide, which does a little quick change in, without telling you that there's a change. OK. Um, so there was this great insight that you, know, you add these, this friction term to these Hamiltonian dynamics, and great, you get the right thing. But what if you're looking at more complicated dynamics? What's the right correction? How do you show you know, what's going on? And each of these things requires a really detailed proofs and a lot of insight into what you should do to correct um, the, the noisy dynamics. And so what can we do more generally? Well, the cool thing is we can just go back to this general recipe that I presented. So this was this D and Q framework. And this was the original update. Um, so this is using the full data gradient here. And you, you can propose a stochastic gradient version that has exactly the same properties. So here's our noisy gradient. Um, and what you need to do is you need to subtract off an estimate of the variance of the stochastic gradient noise. So this is a formulation that skips a couple steps, but you don't actually need to know that. You need an estimate of it, though. OK, and one of the cool things is if you had gone through an SG version of HMC in this framework, this friction term that Tianchi like, thought of you know, out of um, nowhere, basically. Uh, not out of nowhere, clearly. But um, it falls out naturally. You wouldn't have had to have that insight. It, it just comes from this, this product here. OK. So going back to the question of how do you think about defining Ds and Qs, open question about how do you define Ds and Qs that correspond to efficient things, but you can Think about using existing Ds and Qs as building blocks and then doing different changes on them to get different properties for new samplers. So let's go through one example here, which is a Riemann version of SGHMC. And so it was something that um, people were interested in and tried to define for a while. Um, but even if you build off of the SGHMC approach of having this friction correction, you get the wrong stationary distribution. But instead, what we can do is, using this general framework, just take the D and Q associated with SGHMC, which I've written down here. You can go back and show that this is true. And then just make them state dependent. And then you get a Riemann version of this algorithm. Um, and the theory says that it's going to be doing the right thing. Um, and so we applied this SGRHMC algorithm to a streaming LDA analysis of some Wikipedia articles. Um, and so this is showing perplexity over iteration. So 
articles explored. And what we see is there's a significant improvement in performance by going to the Riemann version of these algorithms. Um, that's because mass is concentrating um, in this LDA type of example. And having the Riemann um, version really helps in exploring that. But there's still some benefit in each case going to the Hamiltonian dynamics instead of these Langevin dynamics. And overall, the top performer is this SGR HMC procedure. That, that plot doesn't disturb you about the convergence of your original algorithm? Or either, for that matter, I guess? It dis does it disturb me about convergence? Well, it looks like it totally hasn't converged. Oh, I mean. <laughs> oh. What? You're, you're fitting, yeah, you said they have the same stationary distribution and they're giving completely different results. What has the same stationary distribution? SGLD and right. SGRLD. That's what you just said. So. Oh, yeah, I mean. So the results should be the same if you're. No, right I, under, I understand. No, exactly. Kind of leveled off. So. Right, because without the Riemann version, it's just still not very well exploring things. So it's, you know, you, yeah. Yes. Oh, it's the wrong stationary distribution? Um, the, the no, you'd have to run it. It's not like... It's just not mixing. Well. Yeah, yeah. You haven't said anything about the rate of convergence yet, right? No, and we don't have results on rates. Yeah. But you observe it's faster than... Yeah, exactly. So, so in the yeah. toy example where you had the two hills on a yeah. one-dimensional line or multiple hills, yeah. is it provably faster than... Yeah, so we have lots of results in the paper versions of these things showing different simulated scenarios and things like that. And I'll go through a couple, but yes, we definitely have much more thorough analysis than what I'm going through here because I wanted to cover dependent data too. We'll see if I get to that. <laughs> okay, um, so very, very, very quickly, because I do want to get to the dependent data that was part of the insight here, was um, I wanted to do a comparison with what I'll call these divide and conquer approaches to paralyzing MCMC or embarrassingly parallel MCMC. Um, and these are really preliminary results. So. Um, don't take too much away from this, but the um, point is if you have some large data set like David was mentioning, you can distribute these data subsamples across machines. And of course, you distribute your prior as well. And then you run MCMC separately on each of these machines. You have to maintain those samples to form these sub posteriors, and then they get merged together to form an overall approximation of your posterior. And there's lots of different ways you can form these sub posteriors and do this merge step. Um, so early on examples were consensus Monte Carlo, which assumes each sub posterior has a Gaussian form, and then the overall approximation is Gaussian. Um, and then Neiswanger proposed doing a kernel density estimate per sub posterior, and then MCMC to, to merge these different estimates to get the approximated posterior. Okay, so Jack Baker, who's a student joint with Paul Fernhead, has just done some analyses comparing these things. Um, so one target distribution we're looking at was a multivariate T, heavy tail distribution, and so the red curves represent um, what we'll use in place of the, the target posterior, the exact posterior, and the blue curve is the consensus algorithm, this is the KDE version, and this is stochastic gradient HMC and stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. Um, and on the bottom what we're showing is the KL divergence between those two distributions. Um, for each of these different algorithms. And so you see that this simple assumption that the consensus algorithm is making, it's not too bad in this case. And we do see that the momentum from HMC helps explore some of the tails of this distribution here. Um, if we look at a multimodal posterior, things are obviously a lot worse for the consensus algorithm. Um, the KDE is doing a bit better. Um, but these SG-based methods are, are performing um, better than the parallel methods. <sighs> oh, thanks. OK. Clearly, I should have switched to my new laptop instead of my very dated one here. But um, any questions while I'm? I mean, the more recent um, EP, MCMC things do a lot better. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Don't take too much away from this analysis that he had done, but. methods kind of suck in multimodal and heavy tails. Yeah. OK. So um, the correlated target distribution, you see the same type of story, KDE doing you know, fairly well. Um, but of course, the kernel density estimate is going to scale really poorly with the dimensionality of the, the target distribution, so the parameter space. 
whereas the other methods are really robust to that dimensionality. Um, and we also did an analysis on LDA. Um, and because of the size of the, the dictionary here, we didn't even bother looking at KDE, but clearly a lot of benefits to looking at these stochastic gradient methods. Um, so yes, I would love to do a comparison to some of the methods you've been proposing, but this is this were the initial ones that Jack had done. Okay, so when did I start? Maybe 15 minutes ish. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about mini batch methods for dependent data. Because if you remember from the beginning of my talk, I said a lot of the group's interest is in looking at time series. And um, there, clearly, we have dependent data. And like I mentioned earlier, all these stochastic gradient-based methods, they never state that you're really assuming that you have these IID observations to form these mini batches. OK, so let's look at this in the context of a really simple dynamical model, the HMM, where there's an underlying discrete valued state sequence, where condition on that state sequence, your observations are conditionally independent. And we have some set of global parameters, using the terminology that Dave was using earlier, um, that represent our transition probabilities as well as our emission parameters. There are also arrows here, but I'm just going to remove those for clarity. OK, so let's very quickly review batch learning for HMMs, super, super quickly. Um, so almost all algorithms, whether you're talking about EM-based, variational-based, MCMC-based, um, for learning HMMs, there tends to be some underlying forward-backward routine where you propagate information forward, and then you propagate information backwards in time. And then you combine these two to form your smooth local state belief, so the probability of being in some state given the entire sequence of observations. And then you use these local state beliefs to update your belief about these global parameters. And you iterate back and forth. OK. Well, the cost of this algorithm is OK squared t, where k is the number of states in the HMM, and t is the length of the time series. Um, and so clearly, this is going to be really, really computationally inefficient when you're looking at very long time series. So for example, uh, one application where we're faced with this challenge is segmenting this human chromatin sequence, where um, there are 250 million locations across this sequence. So having to do a pass through all 250 million locations per little update in the parameter space is pretty infeasible. OK, so can we just use these mini batch based methods that we've talked about for hidden Markov models? So we could think of just looking at some little subsequence, so some set of local variables, and then doing a local forward backward pass here, and then using these local state beliefs to update our global parameters using, for example, a stochastic gradient step or something like that. Um, well, the issue here is that clearly information is getting blocked, right? We're not properly propagating information from our past and future observations and forming these local state beliefs. OK, so if these represent the true state beliefs as if we had done the full forward backward, on the bottom here are examples of just what the approximation might be. So the question is, are we out of luck? Well, one thing we can do is leverage the fact that there's memory decay in this process. Um, so for example, do we really expect that the state at time t is going to strongly influence the state at time t plus a million? Probably not in most applications. OK, so what we can think about doing is what I'll call buffering, where you do a forward backward on a longer subchain until locally within this solid red box, your approximated um, local marginals are good approximations to the true marginals. And then um, in practice, you typically only need a very limited buffer relative to the length of the time series you're looking at to get good approximations. And complexity, of course, is dramatically reduced per iteration. Um, and similar ideas were proposed in this Splash BP paper for parallelizing belief propagation. Um, but there, they assumed a fixed parameter setting, where as here, we have this uncertain parameter setting so in particular, our buffer size depends on um, our current belief about theta. So we're going to take theta, do this local procedure, then update theta and do this iteratively. OK. Buffer size 
that because of the bit of the Because yeah. that encodes basically the memory of the process, right? So if you have, if you initialize to some theta that says it's a super long memory process, you're going to need very long buffers. And yeah. Before a given theta, can't you just compute the special gap explicitly? Before, you said before. Before a given theta, when you're making an update, since it's an so, iterative algorithm, right? Right. Can, can you just compute the special gap and just? Yeah, so, so I'll get back to that for, it's a little bit, yeah, I'll get back to an idea for the MCMC approach, if that's okay. But yeah, I mean, you can look at the second largest eigenvalue of the, the, major, the transition matrix and do things like this. So um, in this case, it was a little more complicated for reasons I can discuss offline, if that's okay. So we looked at this idea in the context of stochastic variational inference, um, and I'm not going to talk about the algorithm, but you can imagine, based on Dave's talk, how you could think about using these ideas in that context. Um, and you can prove that if you're within some epsilon approximation of the true marginals, then the algorithm converges to a local mode of the objective, just like in the batch case. Um, but we use it to segment this human chromatin sequence, where the previous analysis used a dynamic Bayesian network, um, so a more complicated dynamic Bayesian network, and because of complexity of inference in that model, had to break this sequence into little chunks and analyze each separately, um, whereas we used a very vanilla HMM, uh, Gaussian emissions, and applied this SVI procedure to it. Um, and we actually ended up with lower false discovery rate of promoter regions. Well, let's just say competitive performance, but here, this algorithm was highly optimized, distributed across machines, and took days to run. And ours finished in under an hour. OK, but the point of this talk was talking about MCMC. So let's think about whether you can use these mini batch based methods in the context of SGMCMC. So, why is the talk not over? And I have a couple more minutes to explain why there's still a story here. Um, one of the challenges is the fact that SGMC. MC um, assumes that you have a continuous parameter space that you're sampling. And all the algorithms that we've talked about for HMMs are doing these operations on these discrete valued latent state sequences. The other thing is that in the MCMC world, you have to be very careful when you're thinking about proving that you have the correct stationary distribution. Things are a little bit more finicky than in optimization, where you can just say your noisy gradient is close enough to your true gradient. Um, so you have to think about this in the context of this finite buffering and the fact that our subsequences that we're using within a mini batch are correlated with one another. Um, other limitations to SVI HMM is, of course, it's a variational approach, so it's really targeting an approximation to the posterior. We were assuming conjugate priors. Of course, you could do some of the fancier, newer things um, instead of that. And we also use this heuristic buffer length estimation procedure. Um, but here we're going to propose something that's more formal. So we're going to try and avoid these assumptions here. OK, so the first challenge is the fact that we want to get to this continuous parameter representation. Um, so what we're going to propose is simply to marginalize the latent state sequence. And what this picture is kind of poorly trying to represent is that everything gets connected when you do that. But the local correlations, if you're focusing in just on a region, um, very, the observations are more correlated locally than they are far away. So you still have this memory decay to this process. OK, but let's write down this marginal likelihood explicitly. And here, pi is just, pi zero is just the probability of being in any state at, um, initially. And these big P matrices, so A is our transition matrix, and these big P matrices are just the likelihood term. So the likelihood of observation yt given some state assignment represented as a diagonal matrix. So this overall big matrix vector multiply is doing just a forward pass or backward pass of um, the forward backward algorithm to compute the marginal likelihood. OK, well, it's going to be useful to rewrite this in terms of focusing in on one little subsequence. So in particular, I've just expanded all the terms in this marginal likelihood calculation. And I'm going to group together all the terms corresponding to these observations. And likewise, all the observations here and observations here. So these observations, if I just do this product up to this point, represents this forward message of probability of being in some state given the history of observations. And likewise, on the right-hand side is the backward message, so probability of future observations given a state assignment. Okay. Um, 
So this is just a rewriting our marginal likelihood. And what we can do then is we can um, pass this into our gradient-based MCMC step where we have to compute. This would remember that our potential energy is just log likelihood times log prior, or plus log prior. Um, and so this is our, our likelihood, plug it in, compute the partial with respect to um, some parameter of interest. And if we compute that partial, you end up with this really nasty thing, and I'll break down why it's so nasty. Um, basically, because of the product rule here, and if you expand out all these terms, this partial, it's going to end up touching everything. And so you can rewrite it in a lot of ways, but one that's really convenient is summing over a set of disjoint subsequences. And let me just rewrite this here. So the gradient that we need in our MCMC procedure has a sum over all disjoint subsequences. And worse than that, there are these q and pi operations where for each one of these subsequences, we have to do this forward backward thing. We have these messages coming in. OK, so this is pretty doubly hideous. Um, but what we can think about doing, again, is taking a stochastic gradient approach where, in the simplest case, you would just look at one of these little subsequences in that sum. Um, but you still have these q and pi calculations. So remember what these are. And a question like we asked before is, if we're looking at the probability of being in a state at time i, does that really depend on the entire history of observations? Probably not. Um, so we can think about approximating these, again, using the same types of buffering ideas we talked about before, where this is expanding the form of these. We just look at the likelihood terms in the buffer regions and ignore all the observations outside those buffer regions and use that as an approximation. OK, so the question is how much buffering is sufficient? And here, what we're going to propose doing is estimating the buffer length by estimating the Lyapunov exponent of the underlying random dynamical system. Um, and so for a given error tolerance that you might specify, we can then tell you how long of a buffer that you need. OK, and so if you think of mini-batches, you think of collections of observations. Here, our mini-batch we're going to think of as collections of subsequences. So this, what I've talked about, is just one subsequence. But we might want to introduce collections of subsequences to improve the efficiency of the stochastic gradient method. Um, but these subsequences are correlated with one another. So what we're going to do is we're going to enforce a minimum gap new, which is also in this case, it's estimated based off of, this is going back to what Ryan was saying before the spectral gap there. OK, so what this allows us to do jointly, now that we have these approximately independent little mini batches um, that have approximately the right um, uh, gradient computation, is we can appeal to the central limit theorem, as we did before, and plug this into our SGM-CMC theory and show that in the case of HMMs, we're, we're getting at the right thing. OK, so I'll just wrap up with a really very quick analysis of some ion channel data where um, this data was studied previously by in these papers that were developing Bayesian nonparametric dynamical models. And because of complexity of inference in those models, they looked at either 2,000 or 10,000 observations, whereas we're looking at over 200,000 observations. And what these plots, this plot is showing is this is observations over time colored by inferred um, state. And this is using a batch gradient-based MCMC method. This is after 700 seconds, 2,000 seconds, 7,000 seconds. Doesn't look like it's changing much. So you might say, OK, it's converged, and I'm going to produce this as my segmentation. Um, but if you use the SG version of that algorithm, then this is after just 44 seconds. Looks pretty similar to what you're getting after 7,000 seconds here. 130 seconds, 460 seconds, qualitatively different here. Um, and so much more rapidly, you can actually show what the converged solution here looks like. So if you run this out forever and ever, you eventually get to things that look like this. Um, so this is a plot showing this. I won't go through the details. This is log-log scale. So you really see the difference in the scalability of these approaches. OK, so to wrap up, um, 
we presented this general recipe for devising these continuous dynamic based samplers defined just by these two matrices. Um, and we talked about stochastic gradient versions of those algorithms, both for independent data as well as dependent data sources focusing in on HMMs and talking about this idea of buffering that leverages the memory decay of the process. Um, and of course, the marginal likelihood representation was really key um, for these SGM CMC methods. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? We have to take a couple questions. Is there any way to tell how much you're like losing? I mean, you were focusing on this kind of machine learning kind of like output, but I mean, um, if you're if you're running this kind of I don't know, we have these neuroscience studies, a bunch of animals, and you want to see what's different in brain networks across groups, and you have, you know, tens of millions of time points. You do yeah. this little mini batching, and the scientists want us to know, like, how far off are you? What are you losing for doing that? What you, so what is the error that we're introducing yeah, in how our... Much, yeah, how much information are you losing about things you care about? So it, like, we have, just like you have theoretical analyses, we have theoretical analyses of the correctness of these algorithms, but of course in practice there are choices that you make, just like so the, the, the asymptotics like you in your results forever. don't kick in, right, when you're dealing with your neuroscience data. I mean, so if they're forever, it's going to converge to whatever, the right thing. So yeah, but, yeah, yeah, we have all that. that I mean, no, no, it's not about, it's, I mean, it's, okay, I'm failing to see the difference here because MCMC, again, it's run it forever, right, and you, as you're running it, you have the right stationary distribution. Our, our correctness is not about how long you're running it. Our correctness is about letting epsilon go to zero. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So I'm saying, practically, what do you lose? How much information are you? So losing? the uh, the loss is not setting epsilon to z letting epsilon go to zero, right? That's that's the only place where the approximation kicks in there. And you have like 50 million time points. You have to you have to have well, practically if you're running it, you can't be putting too much data in, and so. Have you done Practically, experiments where you kind of increase the number of mini batches or the sizes or yeah, something? Yeah, so like in these experiments, our mini batches are sometimes only five observations we're putting in per iteration. And so I'm trying to understand because you're saying I guess my there's an approximation like error. Mini batch was, it was size five. Yeah. Then your and let's say we have practical like, approximation error. Maybe if you did some limit, you don't have any approximation error. But your practical approximation error. Okay, so like, again, you're getting to the practical. Limit. You're getting to the practical question, right? Which is, yeah. I could ask you the same question for your WASP algorithm, right? So, um, yeah. So the practical. No, exactly. No, sure. I guess what I'm just saying is we're all in. Saying does your algorithm? <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. I guess what I'm saying is that it seemed like in your talk you were kind of saying their approximations for these SG-based methods and ours don't, ours do the right thing. And I'm just saying that, of course, no, no, we're no, all no, relying no, on you're asymptotics. Just and just studying a general family of algorithms. And, and I guess I that's my... That in our setting, which is a little different than yours, you tended to need a pretty big batch size right. or your approximation error was large. Right, and so or what we're talking about, so the practical, the practical thing is about the variance of like the stochastic gradient. In our example, right. so I'm just trying to, I'm not so, trying to criticize you at all. Okay, so I guess, then let's say the practical issues. So the practical issues are the variance of the stochastic gradient noise, like in all these cases. And actually, Jack has some results on using control variates to reduce that. Um, but that's one thing. And there are theoretical results in the simpler dynamic cases, like the Langevin dynamics, on how you think about what that error is. Um, but yeah, in practice, that's why I was saying, here's the picture. You don't just choose one little subsequence, you choose a whole bunch. But remember that you're, um, uh, so, okay, so in things that have very long memories, this can be really efficient because if you look at a mini batch of length 100, you might be getting just one little part of what's happening in the time series. But if we look at 10 mini batches of size 10 that are distributed across the time series, in practice, you get much more efficiency because you're exploring different parts of what's going on in the process. So it has to do the trade-offs, and we explore this in the paper, but the trade-offs between how many observations you choose versus how many, how many observations per subsequence versus how many mini-batches have to do with properties of the underlying dynamical process, of course. Um, and of course, they're the same kind of results as all these stochastic gradient methods that it, 
as you're increasing the number of observations, you know, you're reducing your variance and getting better performance along. So same kind of ideas there. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another part that I missed from what you were saying. But your question was, how many observations do you think you need to put in in these neuroscience applications per iteration? Is that what you're? OK. Sorry if I missed the point there. So for these continuous based samplers, I mean, from, from the physical perspective for these continuous dynamics and the style that you've written down, the only thing that will change the stationary distribution is the Hamiltonian, the H. It's the, yeah. Right, so, so the, I, I'm a little confused about why you're constraining. I mean, essentially, it sounds like you're saying that anything will work as long as you don't add an external force. Right, some sort of external. Right, as long as you have a detailed balance dynamics, then you're going to sample the rate. Distribution. So actually, I should say that these are not reversible processes that we're defining. So, but what do I mean? Yeah. So, so I mean, detailed balance is sufficient but not necessary, right? And so these are not satisfying that. Okay. And same with the irreversible Metropolis Hastings sampler that we proposed. That also breaks that by definition of being irreversible. Um, and so let me understand more about what you're saying. Well, so, so. so I guess it, it seems to me like you're saying that you can you know, pose these various like, diffusion tensors yeah. right, in your stochastic uh, <laughs> differential equation, and that they don't affect the invariant distribution, which you know, is, I mean, from the perspective of, of having Hamiltonian dynamics, that, that's obvious, right? right, right. The dynamics, but you're not changing right. the distribution at all. Right, but that's not obvious. For I can write down lots of dynamics. For example, like the SGHMC dynamic is doesn't have the right invariant distribution, right? So I can write down lots of examples of dynamics. Sure, but that's because you've changed the you've changed the H term by adding some sort of external force. Right. Pushing it away. Right, but what I'm saying is you can specify an H. Of course, you can't specify an H in different Ds and Qs and get things wrong because our framework, that, that is our framework. But you could specify an H. You don't have to go to the stochastic version. You can specify an H in different pre-multipliers of that H in different forms for the noise and get wrong invariant distribution or things that, like, the target is no longer invariant. So it's only under this specific form of the SDE. And it doesn't have to be an SDE. You can have that noise term go to zero, so it can be an ODE. But under that, those are all the cases where pi is invariant. And I can write down cases that aren't in the framework, and then that doesn't have the right invariant distribution. Yeah, I guess I'm just, I'm just confused about how to think about what, what advantages I can get from choosing different Ds and Qs. I mean, is it, should so I, I think like the Riemann one was an example. So going back to, I won't flip all the way back, but the LDA example, like without that Riemann thing, those samplers still weren't doing great. They still weren't exploring the posterior very well because mass gets like really concentrated and these that is reducing friction in certain parts of the the landscape so that you move more easily. Right. You need the geometry of the space to really help you get between those points. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So there's a reception now. Uh, see you tomorrow and at the